Yeah, as you'll have just heard, we've just started um, recording because we like to make these sessions available after the, after the fact so that people who couldn't make it can hear. Um, so it does mean that if your camera's on or um, your microphone's on, then you may be captured in the recording. If for whatever reason you don't want that, you can turn those things off, but we love to be able to see your face if you're happy to potentially show up. Um, so, uh, today um, I'm actually only uh, doing this very first part um, which is um, acknowledging and celebrating the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet. Um, today I join you from Canberra, the lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present, emerging and um, those all around Australia. Um, I'm yeah feeling particularly uh, privileged to join you from this land today. I spent the weekend in one of the national parks and I'm really appreciative of being able to yeah join you from somewhere so beautiful and so peaceful. Um, so uh, thanks for coming along to this meeting of the Sensitive Data Interest Group. Um, I normally kind of chair these meetings, but uh, today I'm um, both happy and sad to uh, hand you over to Kylie Black, who um, I've had a change of role within ARDC and Kylie is uh, now taking the helm as sensitive data expertise coordinator. I'm sure that's not your official title, Kylie, but um, it's the one I've just given you. <laughs> and um, so from now on, Kylie will be um, organizing and chairing these meetings, although I will still be lurking in them because they're super interesting. Um, so yeah, I'd just like to thank Kylie and hand over to you. Thanks so much, Nicola, for that um, handover and intro. And I've, I've got to say, Nicola has left me with some big shoes to fill. Um, so yeah, hopefully we can keep going with the good work and the really interesting topics and um, it's fabulous to have your support and the handover and all the links and everything. Um, yeah, it just makes it so much easier. So, yeah, um, I'm going to do my own acknowledgement of country. I'm here in Perth on the lands of the Wajok Noongar people where it is nice and cool today, unlike the East Coast. So that doesn't happen very often. So we'll enjoy this cool weather while we've got it. So, yeah, I'd like to pay respect to um, the elders past, present and emerging here as well in WA. Okay, so um, Nicola's already mentioned about the privacy and recording. Yeah, we've got the recording happening um, and I will make it available on the YouTube channel along with the other Austic recordings um, through the ARDC. So yeah, just turn off your video if you don't want to be identified in the recording. Though if you are happy to do that, it's nice to see some friendly faces and especially for Lisa when she does her presentation. Okay, also we do have the Ausdig mailing list, um, which many of you might have seen the post about today's session. If not, you can, um, it's, you're very welcome to subscribe to that mailing list and be notified of future meetings that are happening. We also have a collaborative notes document. I'll put the link in the chat in a sec, um, where we've got notes about our um, previous meetings, links to all the recordings, um, and there's space in there to add suggestions for future meetings. So lovely to get your ideas on what you'd like to hear about when we meet in future. Okay, so now I would like to hand over to our guest speaker today, um, Dr. Lisa Eckstein. I would like to also give credit to Kristen Kang, who, as I've said, everybody knows, um, for recommending Lisa to present today. Um, Kristen worked um, with Lisa as part of the Hassanda project, um, and I thought that this idea of sharing information about the National Data Sharing Statement and all the work she's been doing in the INFORMED pro project will be of interest to this group. Um, so what I might do is I'll stop sharing um, so Lisa can start. And what we'll do is hopefully we'll have time uh, for some questions and discussion at the end. So if you could just hold your thoughts until the end, we can have a, a chat afterwards. 
that's totally fine. If people want to jump in while I'm talking, um, that's also fine, um, especially if people have limited time and aren't able to stay to the end. I may not always see it on the screen, but feel free to treat this quite informally and jump in as needed is fine by me if it's fine by others. Okay, let me start sharing. Good, Lisa. Okay, is that working for you? Yep. Okay, perfect. Um, I am Lisa Eckstein, as Kylie has mentioned, and thank you to Christian for bringing me into the loop. I do want to note that I'm really here presenting on behalf of the Informed Project team, um, and I do want to acknowledge Sky Nolan, one of our team members who takes the lion's share of the credit for developing the slide pack. That is a lot of what I am using. Um, the work, no. Here we go. Um, giving my own acknowledgement of country, I am in Nupaluna, Hobart, on the beautiful land of the Muaninya people. I do want to pay my respect to respect the Tasmanian Aboriginal community, past and present and emerging. As Kylie mentioned, I have the privilege of directing the CTIQ project um, and in particular talking to you today about really something that has been CTIQ's flagship project over the last couple of years, which is the Informed Project. I do hope that many of you have had a chance to download the template and the user guide for some additional context on what I'm talking about. All of our template user guide and portal for feedback is at www.informedpicf.com.au. Um, please do go there to download and to provide feedback. There, one of the things that we have set up is capturing people's email addresses so that we can prompt them for feedback, but some people's email addresses are blocking delivery of their template and user guide. If that is happening to you or has happened to you, feel free to email me or the email address listed up there on the website um, and we can just email you a copy of it directly. Okay, let me just see something in chat. Okay, thanks, Kylie. Put it in the chat. Okay. Beginning question is who is CTIQ and why on earth would we be doing this project? CTIQ started up in 2018 as an Australian member-based organisation. Our founding members were Belbury Limited, the Australian Clinical Trial Alliance, the NHMRC Clinical Trial Centre and the George Institute for Global Research. Once we joined with the benefit of MTP Connect Growth Centre funding, we also brought Medicines Australia and the Medical Technology Association of Australia into our executive committee, which is our main decision-making body, so that we had broad representation from across the sector. We also now have about 50 members from across the Australian clinical research sector, and increasingly I should be saying health and medical research sector because really now a lot of our members um, medical research, but not necessarily clinical research. What we try to do is take on projects that can improve the efficiency, quality and effectiveness of medical research in Australia and develop recommendations for improvement. Our seventh project is the one that I'm going to be talking to you about today, the informed project which had no small task of seeking to design a concise consumer-centred participant information and consent form for Australian health and medical research. Not an easy task and one that has taken a considerable amount of time. I'll run you through what has been going on the last couple of years to give you a sense of the lay of the land and also how we came to join forces with Christian and Hassanda to include as part of the informed project a national data sharing statement. So a couple of years ago, we first set up a project team to develop a revised PICF, did some background research on what makes a good PICF, what should we be aspiring to, supplemented that with stakeholder and consumer surveys to find out from both consumers and people working in medical research what they thought of PICFs they were currently using, what they would like to see in PICFs, 
and then started developing early drafts of what a national consumer-centred participant information and consent form could and should look like. At about that time, Christian and his colleagues got in touch with us to say, well, look, as part of this work, could we have a focus on a national data sharing statement so that we can provide that to Hassanta nodes to have a really robust framework for future data sharing, to which we said, amazing, let's, let's do this together. And so that has been a really helpful and really constructive part of how the informed project has moved forward. With that in place, we developed an example library, worked up three um, mock participant information and consent forms based on the template as it was at that point in time to do consumer consultations. And so for those, we used real um, studies. One was an early phase device trial donated to us from Biotronic, one a repurposed kidney drug study for from the Australian Kidney Network, and one a low-risk social science mental health study provided to us from Origin. We did three consumer consultations run by Dr. Tanya Simmons to see what people thought of the mock PICFs, revised the template further based on that feedback, and then developed a user guide. In the work that we've done, um, we've really followed four key principles. Um, oh, thanks, Christian, for providing that context. The first of these has been involving consumers in the work that we've done. I'll talk a bit about that. I've mentioned it already. Simplifying language and layout, using visual aids and layering information. So in terms of involving consumers as context, we've had two consumers on the project team from the outset. We got 157 complete responses for the consumer survey that we issued and did the three consumer focus groups. Worth noting for those focus groups, we recruited through an external provider and had them specifically um, recruit for culturally and educationally diverse backgrounds. Simplifying language and layout, I'll talk about this generally and then I'll talk about it more specifically for the national data sharing statement. Biggest thing we heard, particularly from consumers, is that many of the PICFs are just really hard to read and navigate. They tend to be very text heavy, very few subheadings, and um, very just hard on the eye to navigate and have a lot of black, white space. So we put a lot of effort into the formatting of what we've developed to try and make it easy for people to navigate. When the team initially started work, there was this idea that we then wanted to make the peak really short. So we had this aspirational idea it was going to be a four-page participant information and consent form. What we actually heard from consumers particularly is they didn't mind the length. They didn't mind if it was eight or nine pages as long as it was easy to navigate and they much preferred extra white space, even if that meant it ended up longer. Okay, we'll talk a bit about um, the privacy language that we put in later, but just to give you a sense of what we, where we ended up and where we came from, the left here is the privacy language as it ended up in the beta version template. The right is the privacy language that was the starting point from one of the PICFs we are adapting. What I want you to see is Firstly, that it's shorter, that it's got bullet points, but hopefully you can also see that it hasn't been about losing content. We've tried really hard to keep a robust level of content, but to make it easier to navigate and engage with. On that note, we've also put in visual aids. So in the Biotronic study that we used, it was about a pacemaker. So we included some visuals so people can see what a pacemaker was and where it was going to be inserted. Consumers have told us that they really liked having tables and other sort of visual breakdowns of information. So that's also something that we've really worked to include in the template as it's presently been conceptualized and issued. And finally, layering information. 
Essentially what this means is that there is a main body of the PICF that includes all of the material information that a person would need to know in terms of whether or not to participate in research. Uh, for any lawyers in the room, the Rogers and Whitaker standard. There also then will be supplementary information for those who want it, and that's particularly pertinent in the privacy and data storage space, where for a lot of people, they don't want any of the details at all. They're very happy to be told it's going to be stored securely, we're going to comply with Australian privacy standards, and that's really the full information that they want. There will be others who are really, really interested in the detail, and we recommend that they be provided with supplementary information that provides the level of detail that they want in order to make a decision whether or not to participate. That's some information about the informed project generally. Really happy to talk about any of that in more detail in the Q&A, but I wanted some time to talk more specifically with you about the national data sharing statement that was done in partnership with Cassandra and the ARDC. When Christian and I agreed that we would sort of take this forward as a collaboration, the first thing we did was establish a project team that had representatives from CTIQ and the informed project team, as well as representatives from AIDC and the Hassanda nodes. And this was really done to ensure that the, what we developed as the national data sharing statement was going to fit with the look and feel of the informed project more generally, but also take into account the needs of the Hassanda and ARDC community. And I particularly want to shout out some representatives from PHRN, Public Health Research Network, who are really invaluable in the work that we did through that project team. There are a few things that we really focused on in developing the National Data Sharing Statement as part of INFORMED. <clears throat> First was really about language, modernising and simplifying it. So, First on that list is removing binary distinctions between identifiable and non-identifiable information. Um, while we sort of moved about away from it in the research ethics sphere more generally, you'll still sometimes see referred to in PICFs de-identified information set up as a binary from personal or identified information. What we did in the National Data Sharing Statement is move away from that binary distinction and instead explain that we were going to be separating information that could easily identify you, like your name or your contact information, from other information that was going to be kept and retained and used in the study. Related to that, we qualified promises of anonymity. So instead of saying we will keep confidential and won't disclose any of your personal information, which we just didn't think was a promise that we could keep in the world of big data. We said, look, when we share your information, we'll take steps to make it difficult for anyone to link the information back to you. This will include, for example, removing information that could easily identify you. And of course, research teams can modify this language as needed for their research project. We also kept a qualifier that there's still going to be a chance that someone could identify you, but we're going to make it small that that could happen. So what we're trying to do is provide accurate information to people about the risks that remain and how those risks are going to be ameliorated by the project team. As with the informed project generally, we spent a lot of time working on simplifying the language. So on the left there, you can see the original language that was included in one of the PICFs we were working from. On the right, you can see how we've modified it. Same content, just shorter, more concise, easier to engage with. Okay. When I talk about the informed project, I often say that we're trying to simplify the language. We're not about making new policy positions. That is sort of true, but when you deal with this kind of project, you also can't get away from making some policy positions, even if they're passive. So I thought it fair to talk to you about the policy positions we grappled with and where we landed for the beta testing version, and hope that in the chat that we have, 
you can add to this. Tell me what you think of where we came to, where we might need to refine our thinking some more or perhaps where we landed in the right space. A big discussion in the project team was how much sharing could be allowed to happen through the National Data Sharing Statement based simply on the original consent that a participant provides to participate in the original research project versus what needed an additional specific consent for future use of the data. This was a huge topic of discussion, really interested in your thoughts. Where we ended up landing actually ended up a sort of similar position to where Australian Genomics landed in their development of a PICF for genomic research. That is that by agreeing to participate in, an, in a research project, you agree to a level of data sharing without any further consent being needed. That is for aggregated information to be shared, so non-unit level data, or information that has been anonymized completely. So not just de-identified, but anonymized. In our minds, that was reasonable to happen regardless of any further consent that a person might give for future data sharing. However, we also agreed as a project team and interested in views on this, that for sharing of unit level or personal data, that a separate consent should be available for participants to agree or not agree to secondary use of their data. So if anything was going to be shared on a unit level basis, simply agreeing to participate in a research project wasn't enough, that that secondary use should be the subject of an additional consent, additional checkbox that a person could consent to or not consent to as they wished. Now, it's fair to say that wasn't a unanimous decision of the project team. It was the consensus, but it wasn't unanimous. And so I'm really interested in thoughts from this group of people about where that landed. The other policy position that we grappled with was how granular to go in the future data sharing decisions. So how many options to provide participants in terms of how their information will be used in the future. We ended up providing two options for the research team. One was quite a broad consent, quasi blanket consent, similar to what's used currently in many Australian PICFs. That is for persons who agree to secondary data sharing that can be shared for any future research, whether in Australia or overseas, whether for a company that is for profit or a non-profit, based on the discretion of the data custodian or research team, whoever's going to be responsible for sharing decisions. However, we also provided an option B, if you like, that had more granular sharing options um, with the idea that um, some research teams or institutions may be um, able to provide that, might have the current capabilities, others won't. Now, I noticed on the chat, has that sentence been um, checked for readability? The bit that's highlighted um, is guidance for researchers um, rather than what we expect to be given to participants. So we would anticipate that people would only keep, that we will only share information that has been aggregated or joined together. Perhaps we should change that just to be we'll only share information that has been joined together, but there was differing views. All of our informed template was checked for readability. On the whole, it came to somewhere between a grade eight and nine level, but the data sharing component of it is a little bit higher than the remainder of it because of the complexity of information. Consumers that we had read it told us it was understandable to them. And so that has sort of been our benchmark but also if people have suggestions about how the wording can be changed to convey the same information in a more concise or reader-friendly way, please do get in touch with us. We are still working on this. We are still trying to refine it and we are still talking to plain language people. But if you see any of this language that you think is overly cumbersome and can be made better without losing necessary nuance, please tell us that is precisely why we're doing a beta testing release.
But yeah, the bit in highlighted says other strategies to ensure anonymization. We certainly wouldn't expect those words to be given consu to consumers. We would expect researchers to find the words to explain what they have done to ensure anonymization. Okay, I want to have plenty of time for discussion, but a couple of open questions for people to prompt discussion, um, but happy to go to other places. As Christian will recall in all too vivid detail, we had multiple discussions as a project team about whether the national data sharing statement should include a qualifier that research projects seeking access to research data, will that the data will only be released for secondary research if it has been approved by an HREC or another ethics review body. We ended up taking that sentence out of the national data sharing statement mostly because of international research, that there are a number of overseas countries that do not require any level of ethics review of um, research projects that are using purely de-identified data. And we were concerned about precluding those researchers from accessing Australian research data and therefore decided to leave it at the discretion of the data custodian what preconditions they were going to specify for the research data to be released. Again, that was not unanimous in the project team, and I'm really interested in views from this group about whether that is the right decision or whether we should include a statement in a national data sharing statement that qualifies um, the release of research, um, the release of data to research that doesn't have ethics approval. Also really interested in general discussion on whether we struck the right balance between the autonomy interests of the research participants and scientific benefits from data sharing. Um, so going back to things like the granularity of consent, whether um, it is the right decision to separate out um, consent to participate in research from consent to secondary use of data. As I mentioned, we had very diverse group, very diverse views in a project team on that and really interested in the views of people in this room. Um, okay, and I see a comment on the chat of using the health literacy editor. We have tested it with several. I would have to check with the team if we've tested it with that one. We also have had a plain language consultant from Westmead Children's Hospital who has also reviewed the form a couple of times for readability. I'm gonna be checking back in with her again to get another review of the form as we continue to refine it. So I'll be doing that as well, but thank you so much, Angela, for that tool. I'll check with the project team to ensure we've used that. So that's the last of my slides. So I might pass over now so that we can have questions and I can jump back to any slides if people want to jolt their memory about any of it. So um, I'll just jump in for a moment. Uh, we're now moving into Q&A and discussion. Um, consent and ethics we know from long experience it's something that people have lots of thoughts and feelings and uh, and questions and comments about. So I have no doubt that uh, once everyone realizes it's time to um, switch on cameras and start interacting a bit, that there'll be questions coming through. Um, I think while you are doing that, uh, I'll just point out a couple of things that might be useful. Um, so the template, for those of you who haven't had an opportunity to look at it in detail as yet, uh, it's just that. It's a template. It's not something that you take off the shelf and use exactly as is. It's something that, as a researcher, uh, that you need to go through and uh, use as a starting point, but then tailor it and configure it uh, to your particular requirements. Uh, the intent there, and particularly the, the section that um, ARDC partnered with CTIQ on this uh, data sharing statement, uh, I'm sorry, data, uh, now I've just gone out of my head. That's really embarrassing. Um, uh, the uh, point there was to give people um, a starting point because actually what we heard, and so for a bit of quick context, for those of you not uh, familiar with the Sander, big program been running the last three and a half years working with 
uh, universities, uh, research institutions, etc., around Australia, lots of clinical trialists. Uh, and a common thing that we're seeing is when it comes to consent, what do we put in there? And now there are definitely obviously groups out there that are already, you know, doing this, have been doing it for some time, have their way of doing it. But there's no real guidance out there. There are a lot of groups that don't know what to do or how to get started. So the template is as much a starting point uh, uh, as anything else. And um, as Lisa was saying, there is an accompanying user guide as well. So, you know, the template is the thing that you can build your own PCIF from. Yeah. But then there's some guidance there for you as the researcher to uh, uh, help you uh, tailor that or bring uh, bring your attention to particular yeah. issues. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Christian. That's really helpful. And I sometimes spend longer explaining that and didn't today because I wanted to get to the data sharing bit. But a few, I guess, rules of how we've done it. Um, all of the informed template is designed to be adjustable. We try to be very clear with people that this is a starting point, but it's not intended as a finishing point. And so we say in the user guide that you should use this as a guide to talking to your consumer groups about the information that they need. That they need. Where there are words that are highlighted in yellow, what that means is those words are for researchers' eyes with the idea that researchers should be changing those words to fit the specific needs of their research project. And they're usually there because there are going to, there's going to be so much variation between research projects and research groups that it didn't seem worthwhile developing template language. And instead, what we want to do is prompt the researcher to think about how to explain their research. So, for example, if a researcher is going to be anonymizing information for future use because they have some kind of tech solution where it's going to create interference with the data or something along those lines, well, they need to explain to their, their consumers what, what that looks like in an understandable way. Um, similarly, we haven't included, often with risks, we haven't included particular language other than tell researchers think about the risks that are material to your research and explain them. For really common risks we've provided some example language but again we expect teams to adjust that and one thing we're trying to do is prompt a more active role of researchers in the way that they develop and draft PICFs so that it's not just a check the box process of selecting the different subheadings but really an active process between researchers and their consumer groups in designing a pick that provides the necessary information. Now I see a comment on the chat saying release requirements for the jurisdiction country holding the information not only the jurisdictional requirement we need to make sure we're following the national standard of privacy laws etc. Absolutely. So one of the things that we did for the National Data Sharing Statement is we sourced a legal review of that to ensure it satisfied Australian privacy laws. Um, that was done by the legal firm Minter Ellison's, whose life sciences team are a CTIQ member, and they were um, so they reviewed that for compliance. With the national statement, again, we have we as a project team um have reviewed it for compliance with the national statement in our view. But one of the things we're really doing during the beta testing phase is speaking to HREC chairs, members, research governance officers, and so forth, to ensure that they also are um, convinced that the requirements of the national statement are, have been met in a satisfactory way. And we're really, um, so far it has been overwhelmingly positive, but we really want to see during this beta testing phase if there are things that we may have inadvertently missed so that we can refine it and add it in before we issue the more final version of the informed template next year. So we as a project team have done that review, but one of the reasons we released it as a beta testing version rather than a final version was to allow for anything that might, may have inadvertently slipped between the cracks. Thanks, Lisa. Um, okay, we're, I'm surprised that we're not seeing questions uh, come through chat or people putting their hand up, but uh, Nicola, Nicola has a hand up. Started. Um, so I've 
Um, I'm not from a health and medical background. So my research background was in the social sciences. So I did have to prepare um, uh, information and consent forms, uh, but I, um, I don't know where the template that I was using came from. And I suppose I also wondered, because I don't have this health and medical background, so are there, is there an existing, are there existing templates that are available sort of uh, sort of nationwide that people use for health and medical research or is it kind of piecemeal at the moment? A little bit of both. A lot of people use templates available on the National Health and Medical Research Council website that were originally developed by, I think it was Victorian Health that took the lead on a drafting. They're about 20 years old now, so they're a little out of date. There's been updates along the way, but it's, it, it's the most commonly used of the templates but it is quite long, very, very complex. We're talking reading grade level above grade 13. Um, and I think there's general consensus that there needs to be a change, um, but getting that change happening has been, has been challenging. A lot of research groups have ended up developing their own bespoke PICFs that they then adapt for individual research projects, and those tend to be held in-house. Um, but obviously that is not available often to early career researchers. Um, those are the most common ones. There are some more specific subject matter ones. So Australian Genomics has prepared one specifically for diagnostic and predictive genetic research that got issued a year or two ago. Um, yeah, those those the most common ones I'd say. Thanks. I know that when I used to do this stuff back when I was a um, research manager, I don't know where the original consent form came from, but when you spin up a new study, you you go back to what was used for the last study and update and revise, and then it just becomes a. Um, uh, is it okay to use the word bastardized version of what was probably an okay form to, you know, semi-passable form to begin with and God knows where it got to? Yeah. And uh, the other thing to add is some ethics committees have also issued template PICFs that may or may not be based on the NHMRC templates and may have their own spin. So sometimes ethics committees will sort of issue their own Belbury developed their own PICF several years back, put a heap of work into it, um, but really, really inconsistent uptake. Um, so, yeah, there's a whole plethora of different ones that get cross-contaminated and bastardised in different ways. Um, okay, a couple of comments here. Outlining risks in the PICFs and how many PICFs gives too much information about risks, which might put people off. Yep. Risk information. So in addition to privacy information, risk information is probably the most overwritten section of many PICFs, according to consumers that we've spoken to and researchers that we've spoken to, particularly with commercially sponsored research. There's often a view that every single risk that could ever possibly eventuate with any degree of likelihood or not, any degree of seriousness or not, needs to be outlined extensively in a PICF for it to perform form essentially an institutional risk management role rather than a informing consumers role. Now that's not necessarily effective. So we know, for example, for a person to give a valid consent to participate, the risk information needs to be provided in a way that is understandable and meaningful to a participant. So no matter if all of the information is set out in a 40 page PICF with 10 pages of risk information, if that risk wouldn't be meaningful for a participant, it doesn't actually perform a risk mitigation role that might be anticipated. So part of what we've tried to do with informed and say, look, you need to make this information understandable and you need to focus on the risks that are meaningful. So if you're dealing with stage three cancer patients, telling them all the risks of a blood draw probably is not going to be meaningful. If you're dealing with a stage three cancer patient, you shouldn't be telling them ris the risks of standard of care treatment that they're going to be receiving regardless of whether they are in a research project or not. 
they might get that information from their clinician, you might provide it as supplementary information, but you need to be focusing on the risks that are research risks, not clinical risks, and that are meaningful research risks. And that is something of an education piece, I think, both for HREX and researchers to come across. Um, and as Nicola put in, I'd expect providing more information may make it harder for the consumer to see the pieces that are actually important. Absolutely. We know that if you put in all of the potential risks of a particular intervention, it makes it very, very hard to pick out the bits that are most relevant. Now, obviously, Atrex played an incredibly important role here in reviewing the risk information that's been provided provided and seeing whether it effectively conveys the meaningful risks that a potential participant would need to know. And each rec, each rec might be different in terms of how much risk information it wants portrayed, but we know that consumers are telling us there's, they're seeing too much of the risks and also that they're seeing not enough of the potential benefits and so it feels unweighted. I'll let Angela jump in because I think she might want to speak to this particular point. Oh, hi, Lisa. Thanks very much for your presentation. Um, I just wanted to uh, pick up the issue of um, ethics uh, review, one of your questions. Um, from, from some early feedback that we've been receiving um, in Sydney, um, it's emerging that uh, researchers who are based inside our health organisations um, are different from researchers who are based in universities and MRIs in that, at least in New South Wales, and I suspect in some other jurisdictions, um, the chief executive of the health organisation is actually technically the data custodian um, rather than the individual researchers. And so a lot of, especially, and this might be for Kristen as, also, as well, but a lot of the, the, the discussions for Hassanda have really oh. been um, with the researcher and the, as the holder of the data that might be shared, the researcher who seeks the consent, the researcher who assesses requests for sharing, and then the researcher who might make decisions around, you know, yes, we will share or no, we will share and whatever. But it, it's actually a bit more complicated in terms of governance, at least in New South Wales. And so your questions around HREC review, like I just wonder, I haven't seen your guide in detail, so mm -hmm. I don't know whether there's some discussion there about checking in around local requirements for both HREC and governance site review. Yeah, no, absolutely. If people are going... If people are going to be accessing administrative data sets, there are going to be very specific things that they need to include and very specific requirements for how that information can be shared. Um, we've touched on that, whether it's enough or not, really, really happy for feedback on. The situation that we have be, that we try to deal with in the informed um, template that I was talking to is where a research team is going to be sort of gathering information and making decisions about how to release it. But obviously where where the information, where decisions about release of the information will always require a track review. If you are in a situation where you have an institution that says we will not ever release data without HREC approval, 100% put that in, 1000% put that in. I didn't want to put it in a template to preclude people in other situations who are currently making decisions to release data that doesn't have ethics review, particularly where the data is being released to a researcher overseas that has no requirement to get ethics review. I was worried about putting something into the template that would preclude valid sharing decisions that are currently happening essentially adding a layer of policy that isn't currently in a policy. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm really happy to be told we got that wrong. If all of the people who we speak to and on this call said, no, we would never release data for research that doesn't have ethics approval, be that overseas research or domestic research, super happy to put that into the template and into the user guide. But I didn't want to put that in and preclude sharing um, situations that are currently a valid part of the ecosystem 
um, if that was going to create a burden that there wasn't, you know, we don't have, as least that I know of, a requirement in the national statement or a requirement elsewhere in law or regulation that Australian data can only be shared with others if that research has approval from an ethics committee, um, it needs to be that the need that the overseas research has, you know, satisfied the requirements of the overseas national statement equivalent. But things like the common rule will say, well, for research using de-identified data, it's exempt. Um, so it, it was one of those situations where I wanted to make sure, say, a US researcher wanted to access Australian data, that that was allowed. But if your institution or if your research group has ethical requirements that go above and beyond that, 100% added in. Okay, thank you very much. I'd add on to that. So just on that very last point about specific institutional requirements, I have been in the situation myself where... Um, that exact uh, the, uh, situation Lisa was talking about where someone from overseas, uh, actually also within Australia, has requested data and uh, said, show us details of your ethics approval. And they said, our institution or uh, does not require it. Went back to the HREC for the institution I was working for and they said, okay, well, get them to write that down you know, they need to provide that in writing. And I guess that's that's the bar we need to cross. So I think it's a kind of um, uh, more complex and definitely in all the consultations that CTIQ ran and those discussions that we were part of, it is clear that uh, not everyone has had that experience or understands that that is sometimes the case. So that if, for those who have not been in that situation, it can be a little bit of shock. Oh, okay. All research, human research has to have ethics approval. It's not that clear cut. Um, so that's why we've taken the approach here that we have. Um, the other comment more broadly that I make, Angela, is, um, yeah, so we've got the, uh, I shouldn't use the royal plural, CTIQ did all the hard work here. CTIQ have the consent form, uh, a template and a user guide. And we've mainly been talking about the consent form today. Um, and that has, uh, and one thing that I, why we were so, uh, you know, uh, supportive of this partnership and this project was the consumer focus of this. Um, and not to be trite about it, but the P and PICF, it's about the participant. And so having that strong consumer focus um, uh, was, was crucial here. Um, and I think the consent form has done a really good job. And obviously, you know, there's no perfect here. It's, you know, if there are additional tools or, uh, things we can use to check language or, or in, improve quality further, and that's a good thing. But I think we've really hit the mark there. There is a accompanying document that's the user guide document. So that's for the researchers. How do I, you know, uh, I've got this specific situation. Maybe I'm within a health service and have that data custodianship issue, or I've got, you know, a HREC that wants, wants me to do things this way, or whatever it might be. Now, We've worked with CTIQ as best we can in the timeframes and resource allocation that we have to start the appropriate sections in the user guide for that. What will be really valuable, if not from people in this room, then maybe your colleagues or whoever, is to provide us more feedback on the user guide, mm -hmm. because I think that's something we could develop a lot more. And the starting point for that is hearing from everyone. Well, and maybe it's, you know, you don't know the answer to to, uh, you know, you don't know the thing that needs to be put into the user guide, but you can present it as, you know, let us know, well, I'm in this situation, I'd need guidance around how to do this. And, you know, we can collect that feedback and over time, uh, see what we can do to provide improved guidance. Yeah, absolutely. I think, as Christian said, this is our starting point. It's not a finishing point. Um, we think that we have taken a really useful step in moving the discussion forward and including some language and ideas that haven't yet been well reflected in a lot of the templates. Now, that's not to say all of the templates. There are absolutely some researchers, some research groups, some HREX using really sophisticated 
understandings and languages, but that's not reflected across the board. Um, it's also going to be one of those areas where there is a huge diversity of experience in the way that people are using data and wanting to share data and being able to take on board that diversity of experiences will be incredibly valuable. I'm always just wondering, Lisa, um, and it might be too early to say, given that it is in beta mode at the moment, whether all these changes to the participant consent information have resulted in higher rates of people consenting. Uh, There's often a better understanding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and look, it's not it, it's not anything we've been able to do yet. It would be amazing if someone had the resources and capability to set up some kind of study within a trial to work out rates of recruitment or the like between using a consent form that is more concise and consumer focused versus uh, what we might think of as the more standard consent form. It's not something that we've attempted to do, but I'd love it if someone did. But we know from the consumer consultations that people told us that the length of current consent forms and the detail, particularly about the risks was off-putting that it made them see risk that wasn't necessarily there um, and that it felt really unbalanced with the lack of any information about benefits, which is often something that Atrex are quite reluctant for understandable reasons to put too much in in the PICF. Yeah. I think Sarah's got a question. Hi. Um, I was just wondering what the expected uptake of this new form is like obviously there was a need for it but are there people who are like yes as soon as it's ready we're going to start using it so some that already have so um the central and i believe southern adelaide local health network hrex have already been implementing it and i believe the western sydney hrec is in the process of implementing it and some research teams are starting to use it we are having discussions with NMA, so the jurisdictions, to talk about whether they would be willing to endorse the informed template for their respective jurisdictions and with the NHMRC about whether the NHMRC would be willing to host it on its, um, on its website. And obviously those are things that will hugely impact uptake. Those are ongoing discussions. We're receiving some really positive feedback, but we also are... Um, you know, really keeping an eye on the feedback that we're getting to make sure that we can make any necessarily refinements and updates to it before we get to that point. Thank yeah, you. and I love Nicola's comment there. Of, um, the other thing I'd love to see is satisfaction with consent, even if you don't see differences in consent rates. I, I felt more confident about my participation in this study or I did, didn't regret consenting to participate later on. That would be an absolutely amazing piece of research to do and um, look as as I mentioned CTIQ is a relatively small organization it's a member-based organization we don't have the capacity to really take on large research projects of our own but we would be really happy to work with any researchers or institutions that are interested in doing pieces of work like that to see if there's ways that we could support that information being obtained. Okay, well, I'm just mindful of the time. Um, and Lisa, thank you so much for that. That was fantastic. I learned so much. Hopefully everybody else on the webinar did as well. So um, you said lots of times that you're really keen to get feedback about all of this. Is the best way to do that through the provide feedback yes, link please. on the informed website? Yes, please. Excellent. Yeah. Um, obviously, I'm happy for my email address um, to be given out. It's on the CTIQ website. Really happy for people to email me directly if they would prefer to give feedback via a chat. Like sometimes it might be that you want to have a chat about things rather than write feedback. That's absolutely fine. But having any written feedback through the portal just makes it much easier for us to collate and anal analyse down the track. Fantastic. Excellent. Well, does anybody have any burning questions before we wrap it up? Okay, well, nobody's jumping in. So thank you so much again, Lisa, for your time and sharing all your information. Um, hopefully, as well as us learning things, you know, you'll be able to benefit from this as well, from the feedback and the discussion. 
Um, and yeah, um, for the Austin people, we do have a couple more webinars lined up later this year. Um, one's going to be Sarah Nisbet from the Australian Access Federation. And um, in early December, we've got Jeremy Kennan from the NHMRC talking about their new statement, um, uh, which is going to come into effect very soon. So um, stay tuned for the information on those um, on the Ausdi mailing list. Um, I can see there's just a few messages coming through. Um, everyone loved it. Lisa, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so thanks for getting in touch with me offline to say um, the non-love bits of it. <laughs> okay, well, thanks very much. Thanks so much, everybody. And, yeah, we'll publish um, the recording online as well so you can share with anybody who might not have been able to make it today. Thanks a lot and have a good day. Thanks so much, everyone.